Hi folks, welcome to the Cannabis Corner. I'm your host, Kerry Burns. Last week we got into the discussion about the Controlled Substance Act, and we're going to kind of pick up right there where we left off. Nixon, in 1970, they passed the Comprehensive uh, Drug Abuse and Pre Prevention uh, Act, and in this act, Title II of this act, is actually what had to do with the Controlled Substance Act. And the Controlled Substance Act itself pretty much was the laws uh, that gave the, the Fed and the state and local authorities the, uh, the power to enforce the marijuana laws. Um, in Section F, F of the title uh, set, uh, created the uh, Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse. And uh, this particular commission was uh, run by a fellow named Robert Schaefer. He was their first chairman of that particular group. And their idea was to look at marijuana and to see where it fit in the grand scheme of things and in society and stuff. And when Schaefer and them met with Congress a year after this commission had been formed, his recommendation to Congress was that uh, marijuana should be decriminalized, that the, uh, the efforts that we were going to with law enforcement and all were just a bit too harsh. And... Uh, he said that, uh, you know, one thing that we don't want to do in the American public is start going after the uh, people's private affairs. And that's, uh, we don't like that kind of behavior. And certainly that is one of the things that they were turning their eyes up. But uh, unfortunately, he, he wasn't listened to very much. And uh, so they didn't do any decriminalization, obviously, and went into Schedule One. Now, with the Controlled Substance Act, uh, basically, it, it like I said, it was the governing part of the... Uh, of this comprehensive drug program that Nixon had come up with. And uh, in, uh, in, in this Controlled Substance Act period, they, they came up with the scheduling of different drugs depending on their severity. And I don't even like to include cannabis in these groups because Schedule One, the one they've got it scheduled into, has to do with narcotic addictive drugs. And as everybody knows, cannabis is not a narcotic. It's not addictive. And so it pretty much defies the very definition of narcotic. It's not addictive. That's one of the definitions of being a narcotic drug is that it's addictive. But they kind of got by that little technicality. You know, it's okay. You might as well say peanut butter is addictive. It wouldn't matter. It'd be about the same. But the scheduling one was the toughest one of the Schedule Fives that they created. And pretty much what they said was that the drug had a high potential for abuse. It had no accepted medical uh, use. And also that there was no uh, way to use this drug safely under, under medical supervision. Which all three of these are pretty much wrong and erroneous. First of all, uh, cannabis is not one of those things that uh, has a high potential of abuse. Yes, there is a high potential for use out there. And but that's only because of all the different properties that this plant offers. It's an herb, and there are many, many people that use cannabis as the herbal form, whether that be for medicinal purposes, social purposes, or whatever. But it's an herb. It's not an, and it's not addictive. Uh, the second part of that schedule one, where it said there was no accepted medical marijuana, no accepted medical use of the marijuana. Well, this is absolutely wrong too, because before the the 1937 Tax Act, doctors were prescribing cannabis for a whole list of medical ailments and, and problems. And so to say that in history we haven't had any medical use of this, this is just absolutely wrong. There's been plenty of documented cases of the different things they've prescribed it for. And of course with the California situation when they passed medical marijuana at least for a while until the DEA just overran them, there were doctors prescribing this for legitimate medical reasons. And uh, my problem with the medical marijuana is, first of all, my biggest problem with it is that it narcotizes the cannabis. And, and it, makes, it makes you believe that it is a narcotic, and it's not. That's my number one issue with, with medical marijuana, is the fact that they are going to go ahead and make it seem like it is a narcotic and we should have control. My second big issue with medical marijuana is the fact that doctors have never embraced herbs as part of their treatment in modern day times now, since the early 70s and forward. And uh, the very fact that we're going to turn this herb over to the medical industry and that we have to get permission or a signed piece of paper from a doctor to be able to use marijuana uh, as, a, as a medicinal help is just absolutely absurd. 
uh, none of the doctors ever, uh, in fact, they tell their patients to shy away from herbs because they, they're afraid they may interact with all the pills that they prescribe them to. So it's, it's sort of really crazy that they come up with this uh, deal that we have to go to a physician. The only way this is going to work is outright legalization. You should be able to grow it in your garden just like you grow tomatoes or anything else. Grow as much as you feel like you need to get you through till the next growing season comes around. That's pretty much how people who live out of their gardens do, and this is no exception. It's the only way that this is going to work. But in order to, 1972, Normal tried to petition the government to reschedule the cannabis to Schedule Two, which was uh, uh, so the doctors could prescribe it. Of course, the Drug Enforcement Agency at the time it was the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, but but by the time that they were forced to look at this, they were known as the Drug Enforcement Agency. The Drug Enforcement Agency has imperial reign over this issue. If something's going to be rescheduled or taken off of the schedule, it first has to pass clearance through the Drug Enforcement Agency. And so, how could the 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 one organization that makes their living pretty much 85% of the time on chasing cannabis and cannabis users? How are they going to be the ones that are going to take it off of a scheduling? Isn't that pretty much giving themselves a pink slip? They'll be without of a job. And so the very fact that they let the DEA be in charge of that is, is ludicrous. Uh, the Human Health Service Director is actually the governing body that, that, con that is concerned with the scientific and medical data that, that is supposed to be being done on cannabis. Of course, that's not being done at, at a very high level. In 1986, the Drug Enforcement's own administrative judge, Francis Young, he initiated hearings on decriminalizing marijuana because he felt like the penalties were way too harsh. And to the, uh, after two years of study, he pretty much concluded that the, heart, the laws were way too harsh for simple possession, even if we were trying to uh, deter the use of it and all. And this just absolutely wasn't acceptable. But John Lawn, who was in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration at the time, he completely overruled it. And in 1994, the, uh, the appeals court there in Washington pretty much voted down the uh, decriminalization of marijuana and said that the DEA had absolute reign over this, and if they decided that we weren't going to take that out, then we're not gonna take it out. The problem with trying to reschedule it and, and doing anything with the drugs, drug laws in America, is that America is tied into the two, two different treaties. One of them's called the Single Narcotics Treaty. This was done in 1961 by Anslinger. Hey, the guy that helped bring about the Marijuana Tax Act from the 1937, he's still around, they couldn't get rid of him. He wasn't satisfied, so he goes, he wanted to you know, control the whole world. So they have this meeting and they uh, draft this treaty called, for short, it was called the Single Treaty. And then in 1971, they did one called the Psychoactive uh, uh, Treaty. And both of these, uh, any country in the United States was one of the countries, there were 75 of them. Some of the countries participating in this treaty are actual countries that we've been to war with since, but they are actually the governing body over this issue. And if, if, uh, if we want to change scheduling in the United States, this will become in direct conflict with this, national, this uh, International Bureau of Narcotics that's run through the United Nations. And that's, that's pretty much how it's snafu. They've got it so worked into that treaty that we can't even control our own destiny here in America without getting permission from the rest of the world. And there is, there's information written into the single treaty that says that if a country's constitution doesn't agree with this, then their president and their, and their Congress has the right to bow out of it. We can actually exit ourselves from this treaty because of our constitution. But we've yet to get anybody in our government from the president, the Senate, the House, none of them, none of them will exit ourselves from this treaty. And so then to try to change the scheduling in the United States over the Controlled Substance Act, we first have to overcome this, this international barrier, which is absolutely ludicrous. You know, these, there are countries that are part of this deal that we've, we're currently at war with and have been at war with since 1961. And I don't think that it's fair to Americans that people that we're fighting are the ones that can control a, a, a legislative issue here in this country, particularly something like cannabis that's absolutely harmless and has never killed anybody, has never even had anybody go to the hospital over it. So you can pretty much see that all of this was done 
to make it so difficult for, for anybody to try to change these laws. And there's been many, many petitions put against the government. The first one lasted for 22 years. It took them 22 years to look at this case, and they were pretty much just ignoring it and using their excuse, oh, we have to abide by our foreign treaty responsibilities and all. But in actuality, what they were doing, they were just ex telling us to pretty much, you know, F off, and that's what was going on. And so... The, it's kind of like the beginnings of when it started out with the 1937 Tax Act. This was done done completely without the, the people having a say of any kind, without the medical community having any kind, say of any kind, without the scientific community having any kind. So we're going to go into extreme detail the next issue of the Cannabis Corner on this single treaty and the Psychoactive Substances Treaty, uh, both from 1961 and 71 respectively. And we're going to look at the details of this and, and how, how this is just so corrupt and, and it just it can't be the governing body that controls us here in America. So join us next time for the Cannabis Corner and we will wrap up our talks on the Controlled Substance Act. Thank you.